welcome to the art course. Whether you're an absolute beginner or you've been drawing and painting for a while now, there's a whole range of techniques and exercises that you can try to improve your artwork. I'm Richard Taylor. I've been teaching people to draw and paint for a while now and I firmly believe that you can become an artist. Now, to start that process, I'm going to show you three drawing techniques that will allow you to draw virtually any subject that you come across. Starting off with a simple line. Now a line can be used to create a shape and then you can use lines to fill in that shape. The closer the lines are together, the darker that shape appears. Artists call this shading. The second technique uses lines again, but this time we're going to use horizontal lines, even diagonal lines, to create a sense of texture. This is called cross-hatching. The third technique involves changing the way you hold the pencil. Instead of holding it as you would to write, put your finger along the edge of the pencil and that allows you to use the edge of the lead to create what we call soft shading. To put these three techniques into practice, I'm going to draw this orange, starting off with a basic line shape, just to see how it works. Now that's the rough shape. All fruits have a top to them, usually where they've been picked off from the tree. If you choose to actually put the top of the fruit at the top of your drawing, it may look a little bit dull. If you twist it round a little bit, however, make a mark for where the top is and take the line drawing around that top edge. The whole thing can look a little bit more interesting. Now, I've got the line drawing. I'm now going to change the pencil grip to introduce some soft shading. And start off by shading around the shape of the orange, making sure that all my movements are soft, loose and curved. Now, oranges also curve around the shape, not just from top to bottom. So to create what we tend to call form, in other words, recreating the shape, we need to start to shade very softly around the shape of the orange, leaving this part here as light as we can to act as a highlight. Now I'm going to darken this section right at the bottom here by increasing the pressure, pushing down a little bit harder with my finger on the top edge of that pencil, shading this way. Then going back to the original direction, shading along the length, back around, back up the length here. And by doing so, we're making one side of the orange considerably darker than the other side, giving it a sense of shape. Now, I'm going to just increase some of the shading on the top of that orange and finish it off by drawing in the shape of the shadow. I'm going to use line shading having changed back to my original grip here, so I'm actually holding the pencil as I would to write with, putting in a whole series of straight lines just using the line shading, technique one. To enhance that even more, I'm going to cross hatch on that far side of the orange where the light doesn't quite reach, where the shadow's at its strongest. I'm going to strengthen that and slowly, gradually, softly fade it out towards the bottom. And the very final touch, I'm going to enhance the line around that darkest part of the orange. just have to draw with pencil. 
I'm going to do a drawing of this apple here using a charcoal pencil. Now the beauty of these is you can really get a sense of physical movement into your work. You can really move your arm around. You can really get some good shadows and some good shading very, very quickly. It's a very spontaneous and instant medium. Now I'm going to change grip here and use the notion of soft shading all around that edge. And as you can see, it's happening before your very eyes. It's quick and you can really get a sense of form into this apple within a matter of seconds. Right now already we're starting to get a sense of the shape of that apple. We've now got to soften everything down a bit and gently, softly, still moving our arm the whole time, not just the wrist any longer, create some of the softer and more gentle tones. Right, it's now time to sharpen those up a little bit. I'm going back to my original writing grip. I'm really getting a sense of depth and strong lighting occurring here by really pushing hard. You know, what you can do, you can actually get your finger in here and just smudge it all around a little bit just to soften up those edges into the light bits and the lighter bits into the white bits. I'm doing this drawing with a water-soluble pencil. Now, this is used in exactly the same way as a normal pencil. You use line shading, you change the grip, use soft shading, just as before, soft shading around the edge, gently blending it in. But the beauty of it is, as soon as you have water, you instantly create a wash. Because what happens is, as soon as the water comes into contact with your drawing, the graphite dissolves into the water and creates this lovely soft watercolory feel. Now you can use your brush to give it a sense of direction. And of course the darker parts here will become even darker still when they're wet, but it's worth remembering they will dry a lot lighter than they actually appear when they're wet because what you're seeing is the water glistening. There, just gently washing that in, taking a little water off and just touching in the top. Now the other good thing you can do is you can actually wet the pencil. And you see that's becoming really dark now and enhance some lines with that wet pencil. So you don't just need to use a brush when you're drawing with water-soluble pencil. And you can sharpen up some edges, which are becoming really nice and soft now, rather like charcoal, but with the fluidity that water will give it. Now, while we're waiting for that one to dry, we can move on to finish this one off over here, get those really dark, strong sections drawn in there, Soften the shading around there, draw in the shadow here, which we can fill in very quickly using a similar technique to that used with the charcoal because it's quite a soft medium, it spreads very well. And I'm now again using soft shading, working around the edges, and it's just ready to add some water. It's great, isn't it? Just a touch of water and pull that liquid graphite now round in the shape of the mushroom, picking up the dark sections in the middle, pulling that water about. And in fact, really, what we're doing is painting now. Because we are in control of where the water and where the tone is going 
using that paintbrush. Now let's sort out that shadow here. A bit of a hard edge occurring here, so let's blend some of that in a little. Working in a round flow in motion all the time. Dipping the pencil in the water and now drawing on to sharpen up some of these lines and really darken some of these sections here. Now, as soon as these have dried, you can go back onto them and add a few little bits of line shading, strengthen the shadow with soft shading here, highlight some of the really dark bits, and just really finish them off using all of your drawing skills to create a lovely, flowing, fluid picture, the one that you've drawn. Learning how to arrange things so they look really good on a sheet of paper is just as important. I could leave them in a straight line like that, but I'm not sure there's anything to really focus on. So let's lay them down. But again, it looks a little flat. I don't really think there's a lot to really get stuck into there. Let's try standing one up. But that looks, I feel, just a little contrived. So let's try... Having one standing up the left, one standing up on the right. Now, that really works. And the reason is that the stalks actually help you to focus right in on that centre pepper there. So that's the one I'm going for. Now, I've made a drawing of these three peppers. And as you can see, we can actually create a triangle between the stalks of the two peppers that I mentioned and that big red pepper in the center. And a triangle is visually pleasing for the artist. I'm gonna paint the first one in watercolor. Now, the thing about watercolor is not to be afraid of using water because too many people, when they start to paint with watercolor, think that they need to use them quite dry and really don't like to let the water run away with their paint. So what I'm doing here, I'm working around some of the highlights I've picked up and I'm just dampening the paper, not soaking it, just dampening it. Spreading the water about, making sure that the highlights are still dry. Because the one thing I do know about watercolour is that paint won't run into dry paper, but it will spread very, very freely onto wet paper. Now I've mixed up here some sap green watercolour paint. I'm putting it on to wet paper and it's going to bleed and it's going to run all around the wet areas but it won't run into the dry areas where the highlights are. Now this first stage is what artists call an underwash and this is to establish the basic colours and the basic tones. Now I've mixed this paint from pan paints. You can buy all sorts of watercolour paints. You can buy tubes, you can buy pans. But I personally like the pan paints because they're very small, you can work them up easily, you don't need to use a lot of them. And they're really not very expensive to buy and they sit very, very nicely indeed in a little set. Now, I need to leave that for 30, 40 seconds probably just so the surface water has been absorbed into the paper. Now while that paint was drying, I've added some blue or ultramarine to this particular mixture of sap green I started off with. And I'm applying this onto the slightly damp paper. Most of the surface water has been absorbed and as you can see it's spreading and bleeding very softly and it's merging in with the rest of the colours. A 
Now the paper's dried, I can start to reclaim a little bit of control over this picture by putting the paint just where I want it in the knowledge that it will stay just where it's gone. So I can actually create some detail here. I'm going to wash it in, just a fraction around the highlight. And it's created quite a nice bit of distinction here, isn't it? We're, we're defining this part of the pepper. Making sure we work around the highlights, I'm going to wash that section in here. I'm still using that particularly dark mixture of sap green and ultramarine blue. And constantly darkening the areas that need darkening. And in doing so, creating a bit more shape for the lighter areas that need to stay light. And the very final stages are to add a touch of rather nice warm yellowy brownish colour to the green. Now this colour is called raw sienna. Leaving that top of the stalk quite light and just to touch in a little bit of colour to that highlight at the bottom so it's not glaring white. Just to take a little bit of the glare out of that section there and maybe a little out of that highlight there. And that's that pepper finish. I'm going to do this next pepper using watercolour paint and colour water soluble pencils. So I'm going to use the same principle as last time. I'm dampening the paper and while we've still got some surface water on, I'm going to put a wash of cadmium red onto this, working around the highlights that I can see on the peppers so that the paint won't run into those and just washing this very, very loosely across the paper. Lots of big free brush strokes. Watercolour really shouldn't be restrictive, shouldn't be fiddly. It needs to be very loose and very free. Now, I've got to wait for that to dry before I can start to work with the water-soluble pencils and start drawing into it. Now that the pepper's dried, I can start to enhance the form by drawing onto it with the water-soluble pencils, just slightly going over some of the highlights to fade them out a little so they don't seem quite so bright. To sharpen up some of the dips in the shadows and to start to create a little bit of a curve on that bottom area, it's looking just a little bit flat. Now I'm having to be quite forceful here because I'm working onto watercolour paper. Watercolour paper is usually textured. So I've got to force the graphite from the colour pencil right down deep into those fibres. So rather like the charcoal, it's quite a physical thing. You have to put some effort, put a bit of movement into it. But it's starting to pay off because already that pepper's starting to take on a slightly more curved feel to it. I'm going to walk into just put a little bit of toning into that highlight there. I'm going to strengthen those dips here, strengthen those dips there, work around the shapes here, and just very, very gently wash over those highlights so they're still looking light. But not the glaring white of the paper. Now here's a little hint. If you get some water or some paint onto some watercolour paper that you don't really want, take a piece of scrunched up kitchen paper and just dab it out and that removes it completely. Now I'm just going to work a little bit more onto these with a pencil, but I'm changing the direction of the pencil line here so that we don't have all the lines going in the same direction. Remember we're looking to create a feeling of form by cross-hatching here. Now we can see those lines and that cross-hatching working quite nicely for us there. It's making the whole thing come alive, it's preventing it from looking totally flat. And the very last stage is to not forget the green stalk at the top there. 
So I've still got a little bit of that green with the raw sienna that I mentioned left in the palette. I'm going to touch that in, allow that to dry for a moment or two, and then pick up the shadows on that with a green water soluble pencil. And the last pepper I'm going to paint in acrylic paints. Now, these are permanent paints. They dry very, very quickly and they stay dry forever. So I'm using a disposable palette, squeezing them out onto there. But they're also water soluble, so I can dilute them. Now I'm just going to use this one brush still. I'm going to dilute the yellow a little and wash it on quite quickly, working around the highlights. As you can see, it doesn't spread anywhere near as quickly as the watercolour did. It stays where it's put. I'm working around the highlights in a slightly diluted version. It's getting a little bit thick around here, so I'm going to add a touch more water. Pull that around there. And by the time I finish this section here, the other side will be nearly dry. Let's work around those highlights. So there, there's a very solid application of acrylic paint gone onto that pepper already. Now, I don't really have to wait for that to dry because I can start to work the shadows in very, very quickly. I'm going to use a touch of green to add to that yellow. Now previously, I've mixed the colours on the paper, but on this occasion, I'm going to mix them on the palette to make sure I get the toning just right. Now I'm going to pick up a bit of a shadow here, a touch more green. I'm going to pick up a bit of a shadow here. The paint's still staying exactly where it's put. I'm going to pick up a bit of a shadow here and a bit of a shadow here. And I'm going to darken this section at the bottom. Now that's all looking rather extreme at the moment. I'll wash the brush to get the paint off. But before it has time to dry, I'm going to put another application of yellow on. So we've almost created three tones. We've got the undercoat, we've got the dark shadows, and we've got the middle tones that I'm blending here now. And for the first time, really, I'm using brush strokes, not just letting the water and the paint wash around for us. Using almost cross-hatching technique to blend those paints in. Now going back up to the top here, adding a touch of yellow, and blending those in a little here. I think we can afford a little bit more of a shadow on this side to highlight the lighter section there. Now that the paint's dried and settled so quickly onto the paper, I can just touch in a few of the shadows here, just one or two here, just some tiny little dots there. Taking off the surface water from the brush, because I don't really want a lot of water at the moment, and just cross-hatching with my paintbrush here to blend that shadow colour in. Now that's the same colour we're going to use on the stalk pulling that paint, which is a lot thicker than the previous watercolour that we've used, right up to the edge, and then again, picking up just a touch of green, to darken it a little, and to run that round, run along the inside edge of that pepper stalk, and just worked in a little, helps to give it the idea of form with the light part here, and the dark part there. So that's the peppers painted, but the job's not over yet. We've got to paint in the shadows that actually anchor the group to the tabletop. Now to do that, I'm going to mix together everything I've used so far, and all of the techniques. I'm going to dampen the paper around where the shadows will be. Then, with some water on the brush, I'm going to take some acrylic green I'm going to mix it with the cadmium red for the watercolour and that will turn a rather muddy 
browny grey, and I'm just going to drop that in, and that spreads like wildfire, doesn't it? Rapidly running out along the line of the water. And if I help it a little bit on its way, just to take up the shape of the shadows that we've sketched in. And then, as it starts to dry, the very last stage will be to use the purple pencil that I use for the shadows on the red pepper and just wash a little bit of colour in, in the deepest, darkest sections. And just with the aid of a brush, pull some of that colour out. So we've got the red, we've got the green, and we've got the purple, all working in harmony to create a balanced composition. Now the last composition we did was based upon a triangle with the bar at the top and the peak at the bottom. This time, I'm going to turn the whole thing upside down. This composition is going to have the point at the top of the mug and the base will run from the bottom of the orange through to the bottom of the lemon. And it's going to be painted in watercolour again. Only this time, I'm going to concentrate a lot more on the shadows and some of the more softer, subtle tones. First thing I'm going to do is to wet the areas where I want the shadows to go. Because we're using a white cup, I don't want colour and shadow running across the whole thing, I just want to select a few little areas. And I've chosen a mixture of ultramarine blue with just a touch of a very, very warm purple. Which I'm going to drop in there and pull it around so we get a very soft form of shading. Now, it's running very, very freely here with the water and I know that it will dry an awful lot lighter. I'm also going to run a bit of a shadow around the base here where that lemon's cast in a little bit of a shadow and there's a little bit of a shadow to be bounced back from that orange. Now because the lemon's yellow, I'm going to drop just a touch of yellow into that shadow colour because a white mug will pick up colours. And on the other side, it's going to pick up the orange, so I'm going to drop just a touch of orange into that shadow colour. Let that flow in and bleed and create quite a complex web of colours in that shaded area. And I'm going to leave those to dry for a few moments while I mix up the colours for the lemon and the orange. Watercolour paints are ever so easy to mix up. Just make sure you load your brush with water, work up the paint and transfer it to the palette. Make sure you have enough for the area that you're going to fill. But Before you move on, make sure you wash your brush. That way you'll ensure that you don't contaminate the next colour and it stays really pure and clean for you. To make sure that I get an even coating on the lemon and on the orange, I'm going to dampen the paper first so that when I do put the paint on, it's going to flow very freely and not get caught in some of the fibres as happens when you put dry paint onto watercolour paper. So I'm working around the highlights to make sure that the paper is evenly damp. Now, having mixed up my colours, I'm going to put a very strong application of cadmium yellow onto the lemon, making sure it doesn't go into the highlight, following the lines round, and to make that area at the bottom just a fraction darker still, 
I'm going to increase the intensity of paint on there. Wash my brush. And now, do exactly the same for the orange. The paint spread in very, very quickly, running very freely, which now means that it's going to dry evenly. Because it's spreading with the water. And while that's drying, I can move over to the handle of the mug and just touch in a few shadows and I can actually see there. Now I have to leave that to dry before I can move on to do anything else. Now, to actually develop the sense of form in this mug, I've got to paint in the stripes. For the stripe in the middle, I've chosen what's traditionally considered to be a very cool blue. That's called cobalt blue. I'm working onto dry paper because I want complete control over where that goes. And for the stripe at the top, I'm using a much warmer blue called ultramarine. Painting that quite carefully, following the line round. And of course, that's the same blue that goes across the shadows at the bottom. Now you can see here where the lemon has actually bled into the blue. I'm quite happy with that. That's one of the beauties of watercolour. It's actually picking up some of the colours of the object that's next to it. I think that works well. Now that the fruit's dried slightly, but not 100%, I'm just touching in the shadows by using the same shadow mixture that I used for the mug. It's blue with just that touch of purple, which helps to warm it up a little bit. Going to touch a little round there, pull it round a little, develop that sense of form that we like so much. It's so necessary to give an object its shape. Exactly the same on the orange. Working around the side where the shadow is, washing it in a touch, And of course, not forgetting the section at the top there. Now I'm going to add just a little bit more orange around here because I think we're losing a little bit of the natural colour. Now, if you find you put a little bit too much water on, or you don't want the watercolour that you've put onto the paper to dry with a hard edge, the best thing to do is just Dab it off with a little bit of kitchen roll. And not only will that remove the paint, but it will help to enhance the texture as you push it down into the fibres of the paper. Now to anchor this group of objects visually onto the table, we have to add the shadows that they cast. Now I'm dampening the paper, but as I'm doing that, I'm picking up some of the paint that's actually on the objects already. I'm picking up a little lemon yellow here, I'm picking up a little orange here because they're going to be part of the shadow. And I'm returning to that mixture that I used right at the beginning of ultramarine, that lovely warm alizarin crimson, and painting in the shadow shapes that these objects cast. Very carefully running around the edge and if one particular paint bleeds one way into the subject, that's fine. If some paint bleeds out from the subject into the shadow, it's even better. And I do want to enhance the shadow here just a little. Let's cast from that lemon. So I'm going to pull that paint round so it's a little bit graduated. Touch in there, touch in there. Now I need to leave that to dry for a few moments. And the very final stage here is just to reinforce the shadow along the line of the lemon and underneath the mug and just a touch here for the orange and just a touch here on the handle to sharpen that up a little bit. And that really is the job finished.
Once you've had a go at painting one or two quite simple objects, you'll probably be ready to start looking for something a bit more complicated. Now, I'm setting up this group of objects here because I love the colours and we've got some really good shapes as well. I've got this lovely blue bottle with a really nice curve to it. I've got this lovely blue and white towel with some really good stripes on it and this set of grapes. And I've got to get them in just the right position. Now, we haven't concentrated much on foregrounds yet, so I think I'm going to create a fold in that foreground that really breaks the lines. So, that seems to work. Let's have a go at it. Now, I'm just finishing off the drawing here, concentrating very much on the foreground. I'm actually following the lines of the stripes. I'm watching them as they rise over the humps and as they flatten out again. And I'm trying to copy those stripes here. What I'm doing is making sure that when one stripe goes behind and underneath the fold, that it doesn't come out at exactly the same place, like just here. I'm finishing that stripe here and I'm starting it just a little bit further on. And that will really give the impression when we come to paint it that there's going to be a fold there. Now that's just about ready to paint. create the idea of colour in this foreground, I'm really going to use the full qualities of watercolour paint, which is mainly the soft edges. I'm dampening the paper just on the far side of each of these folds here. And I'm going to run a line of paint along that edge and because the top of the fold is dry, the paint won't run into that. And I'm going to run a line of paint along the top of this fold here. And again, because the top of the fold is dry, it's not going to run into that. So, I'm work it in just a fraction, touch it in gently there, finish off that line there. And now I'm just going to leave that to dry for about three or four minutes so that we've got a dry edge on the top, but maybe a slightly damp edge just along the top of that fold. Now that that shadow wash has dried, I can start to paint on stripes. And as soon as they come to the area where the shadow wash was, they appear just that fraction darker, which creates a nice contrast between the white so you can see there's a little bit of a shadow there. Now, this stripe comes up and over. So I'm going to wash the blue on there, but stop just short of the top. And I'm going to put a watery line across there, and that's going to run down towards the bottom. And I'm going to add a touch more paint, and that will help us give the feeling that we have a stripe that comes along, goes up, and then comes back down on itself. Now exactly the same on the next stripe here. Paint in the colour, touch a little bit of water along the top, let it run downwards. Now the shadows directly underneath the bottle are going to be considerably darker, so we can paint those with a really strong mixture of ultramarine blue and just a hint of alizarin and crimson, working carefully around that leaf, and exactly the same underneath the grapes. It's going to be a very, very strong shadow on the stripe there. Let's touch a little more water in, and take that round to there. Now I think what we can do is to touch a little bit more of that colour mixture that we used in the shadow directly underneath the grapes in that leaf there, even to make the white stripe look just a fraction more shaded. 
Now I'm going to use exactly that same principle right at the very front of the composition. Now we've just got to move the palette over a fraction and work in that shadow mixture that runs right the way along that lovely big deep fold. Right out almost to the far edge of the composition. And we've just got to give that a second or two now to dry before we can put the stripes on again to create that really intense colour and shape right at the front of the picture. Now, exactly as before, I've got a really good strong mixture here of the blue colour that we need to record the stripes. I'm going to block that in all the way across the shadow colour, which is starting to work with it now and change its tone a little. Just drop some water right onto the top there and pull that down so that runs round the shape enhancing the whole feel of that curve. Now a touch of water on here, washing that out because that curve's actually the round in a rather strange way because there's another fold that's crept in just there which we need to work out a little bit. And the very last stripe to be painted in, this is one right in the foreground, lots of paint, locking in that shape that we've drawn in earlier so that we don't get a hard edge. I'm going to wash it out towards the foreground. I'm also going to wash it out just for effect a little bit on the top there. The techniques you've seen so far have been well within your reach. What you have to do now is to find some subjects that you like, some time to practice and enjoy it. In the next part of the course we're going to be doing some more drawing. We're going to be looking at pen and wash and introducing pastels and we'll be looking at the way that colours work. So, hope to see you then.